Stanford University. Okay, well, welcome to lecture 18 of uh, CS 193P, fall of 2011. Uh, today is going to be my last lecture uh, of the quarter. There's actually one more lecture after this, uh, which is going to be a guest lecture next Tuesday. Uh, it's going to be talking about unit, unit testing. Uh, but today's my last one, so this is the last you'll see me until the final. And um, today we're going to continue the iCloud lecture that we started last time. It's going to be an all demo the whole time. I don't have any other slides uh, other than these, these couple at the beginning here. Um, the, I'll put this slide back up from last time. It's kind of a summary of some of the important points of what I'm going to cover in this lecture. So you could have this up you know, on your screen or whatever while you're watching this uh, demo just to make sure you're catching the highlights. And again, along the way, I'm going to be showing you some non-iCloud things uh, just because they fit well in here and we didn't get to cover them earlier in the quarter, so we'll put them in there now. Uh, the Friday section tomorrow is OpenGL. And uh, that will be our last Friday section of the year because the next Friday, I think, is might even be the start of exams or whatever. But in any case, no, no uh, uh, Friday section next week, just tomorrow. And uh, then Tuesday, unit testing, guest lecture. I won't be there, but, uh, but that'll be the last lecture of the year. Okay, so let us go back to where we were uh, last time which was uh, we were modifying our photomania to work with the cloud. And so far we had gotten far enough where we, instead of going through our normal photographer photos by that photographer and then showing the images, instead of going through that path, we kind of intercepted and just went to this new view controller, which is a document view controller. And the document view controller basically goes out and queries the cloud uh, gets a list of the documents uh, and displays them. And we did that with this new class here, Document View Controller. And uh, the main method that we added, it was this iCloud query here that starts off this metadata query. And then when results come in from the metadata query, we process them by just going through, looking at all the URLs, finding the file package that the files are in. Uh, since uh, UI managed documents are stored in a package. In other words, they're in a directory with files in the inside. So we wanted to find the directory because that's the name of our document. Uh, and we just keep that up to date. And so the next step we want to take is to make it so that when we click on a row in our document view controller, that we segue to our old photographer photos uh, sequence of scenes. Uh, here, in other words, so we can view the contents of a document. All right, so that's the next step we're going to take uh, is to do that, and we do that in normal fashion how we would normally segue. So uh, I'm just going to control drag from uh, this row uh, back to our old uh, sequence of screen scenes here. So I'm just hitting control, dragging down here to create a segue. We're inside a navigation controller, so I'm going to push, and you can see. Created this segue. Let's go ahead and inspect that segue. Uh, I'm going to call it show document because that's what this segue does is show a document. And of course, now we need to go back to our document view controller and do prepare for segue. Anytime we have a segue, we obviously have to prepare that segue, so that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to go down here and do a pragma mark segue and we'll implement prepare for segue. So before I uh, implement this prepare for segue, I'm going to take a little bit of an aside. This is a good place to take an aside and talk about preparing for segue in a table view. And one thing that I like to do is this little piece of code, which I kind of prepped here uh, for expedience, that makes it so that the sender uh, in prepare for segue can be more than just a table view cell. When you control drag a segue from a table view cell to uh, another view controller, the sender is going to be the table view cell. But what if you wanted to perform that segue from your code based on a button being clicked or something like that? You might want the sender to be something different. And so uh, I put this little piece of generic code that you can go in the prepare for segue of any table view. And it allows sender to be an NS index path. Okay, I'm just doing introspection here to see if it's an NS index path that specifies uh, the cell. Uh, in other words, the cell that has the data that we're going to use to prepare uh, this segue. 
Uh, or it can be the normal case, which is UI table view cell, in which case we ask the table view for the index path for that cell. That's what you're probably used to doing. And I also allow some other miscellaneous things, like if the sender could be nil, or maybe the sender is self, in other words, the table view controller itself, or even allow the sender to be the table view. And in that case, I'm going to get the selected rows index path from the table and use that. Okay, So we'll actually use this mechanism. I'm going to, uh, later in the demo, I'm going to perform this segue, and I'm going to pass an index path as the sender, because I'll know what path I want to use. All right, so now, once we have the index path, as long as we were able to find one, and our segues identifier, oops, identifier is show document, then we want to set up, uh, we want to prepare the segue, prepare the destination view controller. So how do we prepare that destination view controller? And in this case, we've chosen a document. Okay, we have this list of iCloud documents. We've chosen a document. Really, all we need to do is communicate that document to the destination view controller. Now, our destination view controller, in this particular case, in this storyboard, is the photographer table view controller. But I don't want to put a reference to photographer table view controller inside this generic document view controller class. Nothing about this document view controller has made it not reusable yet. Okay, I could reuse this in another application that I had document, cloud documents in so far. So uh, what I'm going to do to make this thing stay generic is I'm going to add a protocol to the header file of my document view controller. And uh, that protocol I am going to call document view controller segue. And it's only going to have one uh, thing in it, which is a property. And I'm going to call that property document. And I'm even going to put a little comment here that says, implement this if you want to be segued to by this view controller. Okay, so anybody who wants to get segued to by this view controller just has to implement this property document. Now, in this case, photographer's table view controller is the thing we want to be segued to, and it doesn't implement document. It doesn't implement this protocol, in fact. But it pretty easy to implement because it already does have this public method uh, photo, uh, photo database, which essentially is the document that it's displaying, but it's not called document. So what's an easy way for us to implement this? Uh, I'm going to do that by creating a little private interface here. Let's copy and paste the name. And um, so all I need to do is import the document view controller there. Oops, import the document view controller and say that we implement that protocol. So to implement this protocol, yeah, we could synthesize another uh, property and keep its value in sync, but really we don't need to do any of that. We can just implement the setters and getters. So I'm going to implement the setter for document, and I'm just going to have it return the photo database. And similarly, I'm just going to implement the setter, oops, the setter for document, and have it set the photo database to be that document. Okay, so that's all I need to do. And so anytime uh, this document view controller segues, it's going to call the set document, and that's going to set our photo database, and we'll be rocking. Okay, so here I just wanted to help you understand a little bit about how sometimes you'll want to create generic API so that you can reuse uh, objects more easily. In this case, we want to be able to reuse this document view controller. When we segue, we want to be able to segue, segue generically to anybody who implements that document. All right, so that's what we're doing there. Uh, okay, so now we need to make sure, though, that our destination view controller conforms to that protocol. You may remember this one from earlier. Uh, in the quarter, and it's called the document view controller segue protocol. And as long as it does conform to that protocol, then we can set, call set document on it. All right, so what is the document we want to set? We just want to get the URL um, from our model. Remember, self.documents is the property that is our model. It's up here. Just to show you, to remind you where that is. Okay, so we have this document. That's, that's our model of our document view controller. It's an array of URLs. So we're going to get our documents by saying object at index, the index pass row. 
Okay, so we're just going to get the URL that's associated with whatever row uh, that was either specified directly or from the table view cell or the selected one. Uh, we're going to get that URL. So now that we have the URL, uh, there's a couple of things that we can do. Um, one is maybe we could set the destination view controller's title to be the URL's last path component. Now, there's sometimes people ask a question, should I set the title of some a view controller I'm segueing to in prepare for segue, or should it really be the should it be set in like view did load of the destination? And I think the answer is it depends on the circumstance. Usually it'd be preferred for the destination to set it itself in its own view did load. It's a little more object oriented. It should know its title better. Uh, one thing about prepare for segue, it happens very early in the process, well before view did load, even before outlets are set. Uh, so if you did set it here, and then you set it again in view did load, the destination view controller's set of it, setting of its title would win. Okay, so that would be more object oriented. So I'm going to set it here. Um, just in some ways, you can think of this as the default title for the destination view controller if it doesn't set its own uh, title. Um, and what else do we need? Well, of course, we need to set that document, so we need to create that document. So I'm going to say UI manage document document equals UI manage document alloc init with file URL. Hopefully, you remember all this from your uh, homework. So now I have the document, and then I would just say destination view controller set your document to be that document. Okay, and then we've prepared the destination view controller by giving it the document that was chosen. It's really simple. That's, that's almost all there is to it. Why is it almost all there is to it? Well, the answer here is uh, what we talked about in the lecture last time, which is that we don't really want our core data database, every time we change it, which it could be a large database, to be completely uploaded to the cloud every time and then back down to all the other device all my other devices okay so core data has this mechanism where uh, you know the first iteration of the database gets uploaded along with you know its model and its description and then after that any changes that any devices make get uploaded as change logs okay change this attribute to this add this entity etc as basically differences and then all the other devices download the change logs and apply it to their local copy Okay, so each device has its own copy of the database, and they're all watching each other's change logs and merging, and we're going to show how that works a little later in this demo uh, to keep it all the same so they all have the same document. Well, how do we make that happen? Well, there's a little bit of settings that we have to do, uh, and I'm going to do that in another method here. I'm going to call that method set persistent store options in document. Okay, so I'm just going to add a little method up here so we can keep this all in one place. I'll even copy and paste here. Okay, so we do this, we tell uh, the UI managed document that it's supposed to do this change log business by setting a persistent store option. A persistent store options is a property in a UI managed document um, and you set uh, these options, and it helps to understand how it's supposed to make itself persistent, right? That's why it's called persistent store options. And uh, there's actually quite a few options that can be set in here, and I'm going to take a time out from iCloud and uh, talk about a couple of options that are really kind of cool options, and we didn't get to it back when we were talking about uh, UI managed document before. Uh, but I'm going to mention them here. And these options make it so that if you, let's say you ship your application on the App Store and a bunch of app users are using it, and then you decide, oh, I need to update the schema to add an attribute or a new entity, or I've added a new feature that requires more stuff. Uh, well, you know that when you change your schema now in development, what you do is you go to your device and completely delete <laughs> your application from the device or from the simulator and then reload it with new data. Well, you clearly can't ask your end users to go delete their apps and re-download it from the app store every time you want to change the schema. And so uh, Core Data has a mechanism in it for automatically migrating to a new schema. And so let's talk a little bit about how that works. Um, first of all, I'm going to create a mutable dictionary here to hold our options. So these are going to be the uh, options, and then the document persistent store options is the name of the 
property. So inside here, we're just going to set whatever options we want uh, for a document. So the two options that have to do with migrating, automatically migrating, uh, look like this. Uh, one of them, and they take bools, so I'm going to say ns number, num whoops, number with bool, yes. And uh, the two, they're both that way, so let's go ahead and have both of them look like that. Oops. And the keys, one of them is called ns migrate. Oops, let's go import core data so we get some help from the compiler here. Import core data at h. All right, now when we start typing this migrate, uh, migrate persistent stores automatically option. Okay, so what that one says is um, we're going to migrate any store. If we are using a newer version of the model, uh, we're going to migrate it automatically. And then the other one is uh, infer mapping model automatically. Okay, and that is uh, we, obviously when you have a database schema, you have this model, and uh, you, when you're transferring the data over, you want it to be able to infer that model. Uh, automatically, you don't have to specify uh, how the, you're going to map from one model to, to the next. And most transformations from one model to the next version are pretty straightforward. Uh, there are some rules for how you can change your model in a way that can't be automatically uh, inferred. And so you should take a look at the documentation for that. But generally, if you're adding entities or adding attributes to existing entities, you wouldn't want to change the types probably. Uh, well, that's, that might work, but um, that kind of thing uh, it would work. So. This all is great, so you've got these two options here. It's going to work fine. Uh, but how do you actually create a new schema? So let's look at that. So to do that, we go down here to uh, Core Data, and let's look at our model. So here's our model, and you can see that uh, we've got our photographer and our photo here. And if we go up to Editor here, we can say Add Model Version. Okay, And you specify the name of the new, mer new model version. And then it appears here. Now notice that this photomania.exe model D has now become like a file package, a directory with the two different models into it. And here's our old one, which is still our current one. You see the little check mark there. Uh, and here is the new one, which we could add some attributes here, etc. And then when we want to uh, make it be the current uh, model, uh, we can uh, go and select this top level wrapper here. And go down here, you can see where it says versioned core data model, and we could pick Photomania 2. Now we're going to keep this on Photomania 1 here, but you could pick Photomania 2. And as long as Photomania 2 kind of has convertible uh, changes to it, then uh, when it sees a old Photomania model, it'll pull the data out of it, automatically map it into the new version, and, and uh, make everything work nice. So, uh, so that's... An unrelated to iCloud, this is just a general automatic migration uh, of schema. Okay, so back to uh, our options here. So now let's talk about the iCloud specific uh, options. Well, the most important iCloud specific option you need to set is the name of the document. Now, oftentimes the name of the URL, the last path component anyway, will be the name of the document, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. And actually, you set the actual name of the document, the, the name that's going to be used uh, in, when it's doing all this change log business and all that uh, in this persistent store option. So um, we'll set our name. Let's go ahead and have a local variable for our name and a string name. Uh, we're going to set our name to be the documents file URL last path component. Okay, that's always going to be the name of our document. And uh, you know that may or may not be what you want in your application, but it's certainly easy for demo purposes. And I'm going to kind of uh, be shrinking a little bit what we're doing here and not do it all because of time constraints. But the key here is called persistent, uh, persistent store ubiquitous content name key. Okay, so this is the main one you have to set. If you don't set this key to be the name of your document, then you will not get this change logging uh, behavior. Okay, instead it's going to upload the entire core database every time. Uh, there's actually another uh, one here, uh, another 
key, which is content URL key. You probably saw that. Uh, that specifies where the, um, and let's go ahead and do that here. Uh, we'll call that log URL. And I'm going to actually create a, uh, another function for that. What did I call this? iCloud core data logs, log files URL. All right, so let's go ahead and make that a separate method here. Uh, URL. So this is going to be a directory in the cloud, not in your documents directory. It's very important. You do not want this directory being your documents directory. You want it to be the higher one level up, up at the top level, or, or in the directory in the top level um, in your cloud. Uh, so this is where it's going to store those log files, the change logs. Okay, it doesn't store them inside the document. Okay, it stores them somewhere else uh, in the cloud. So a good place to put this might be something like self iCloud URL uh, URL by appending uh, path component. Oops, there. Appending path component. Uh, let's say core data. Okay, so that's a good place. Some people call that transaction logs or logs or something like that. And so let's go ahead and set that one. Set object logs URL for NS. And this one is called persistent store ubiquitous content URL key. Okay. So by setting these two things, uh, it defines uh, where the core data is going to, going to, going to uh, put its chain logs and that it's going to use change logs. Now, we are just setting these here. And really the right way to do this, which I'm not going to show here, but uh, if you had an existing document in the cloud, you really want to go look at document.fileurl slash uh, document metadata.plist. Okay. You would want to go to your document file URL, open this file, document metadata.plist. It's a property list. You open it as a dictionary. You can just say NS dictionary and it with contents of file. And inside there, you're actually going to have these two keys. Okay, or one or both of these two keys, uh, and then you set the options from that. Okay, uh, so this is if file exists, use contents of instead. Okay, so we're not going to do that today, uh, just for expediency. But you would you would want to do that. All right. So that's kind of an odd thing. We talked about this in the slides. This document metadata.p list. Uh, from the last lecture, but um, this is really where you want to go today. We're just going to do this. So, all right, so now we have this set up so that it can um, open up these documents that have change logs, and we've set the persistent store uh, options there. Um, the only other thing I'm going to do here uh, is I'm going to go over to photographer's table view, controller view and make it so that it puts up a spinner when it's waiting to open a file. And I'm just going to do that so that you can see more what's happening, whether it's waiting for Flickr or whether it's waiting for uh, iCloud. So I have a little code here, this start and stop spinner. All this start and stop spinner does is do the UI activity indicator view, which you guys are used to. Um, it also uh, sets the title uh, of the navigation item so that it's showing you whether it's waiting for Flickr or waiting for iCloud. And then I'm going to call this start Flickr from a couple of different places. When we, let's say, when we set the photo database here, that's a good place to do it before use document. Let's say self uh, start spinner. And here we'll be waiting for the iCloud because we're just opening that we just got, this document just got set from the cloud. Uh, and we're going to be waiting for this. There, there, and then another start spinner. Where else was I going to put it? Oh, let's. If we're going to do a flicker fetch, which is right up here, uh, yeah. So where's a good place to put this? We'll just put this right at the top here. Self start spinner. In this case, we'd be waiting for flicker. Okay. So all this is doing here is starting the spinner, putting up what it's waiting for, and then we're going to stop the spinner. Mm, well, let's just stop it in self or row and index path because we know that once we get some data back, then it's done. This is not quite right because it could conceivably get a document that has no data in it. Um, but again, for expediency here, uh, we'll just do it there. And uh, I think that's everything. Hopefully I haven't missed anything here and uh, this will work. So let's go ahead and run this. And I have two iPads 
here, same as last time. And on uh, one iPad, I already have uh, kind of a little more uh, advanced version of the app running. Uh, and you can see, so let's go over to that other iPad and take a look. So on this other iPad, for example, the capitalized document, uh, I have uh, the photographers that only have capitalized names, all right? Or in the numbers one is only uh, photographers that have numbers in the name. So let's go to our uh, thing that we just wrote. Now, you can kind of tell the difference because R1 doesn't have the plus button yet in the upper right-hand corner because we haven't added the ability to add a new document. So let's go see if this reads it from the cloud. And you can see it's trying to read from the cloud, and there it's got it. All right, so it's read the numbers thing. And same thing as capitalized. Quickly read that one from the cloud. And then all is all photographers. And so you can see that now we can see the documents. All right, so this was really straightforward because all we really had to do was get our UI managed document and pass it off to the code we already had that knows how to display a list of photographers. Okay, make sense? All right, so the next step we're going to do, we're going to do two things. One is the ability to add a document to the cloud. Okay, so far I created these documents on this other iPad. Uh, and we're seeing them here, uh, but now we want to make it so we can add one here, and then also I'm going to uh, put some code in so we can remove documents from the cloud. There's a little bit of a trickiness when you want to remove documents from the cloud that you need to think about, but that's the next step here. So let's start with add. Uh, to add a document to the cloud, I'm going to put a little plus button uh, in the upper right-hand corner here. You probably saw that uh, in the other uh, iPad, so let's do that. Go down here and go to the bottom and get a bar button item. So we're just going to drag that in here. Uh, I'm going to inspect this at bar button item and we'll make it the add button, which is, kind of, which is a built in uh, default button. Now, um, when I click add, I need to ask the user the name of this new document. And conveniently, we have a uh, view controller that knows how to ask the user a question. It's the ask or view controller from the kitchen sink that we wrote. So I'm going to go back to kitchen sink here, and I'm just going to get the ask or view controller and drag it in to this project. Okay, I'll drag it in here. Make sure that we click copy so that we get a copy of it here. We don't want a uh, reference to it. Uh, and so this is the same ask review controller we have from Kitchen Sink. And uh, so all we need to do to make this work is drag out an ask review controller. At the very top here, there it is. So we'll drag this out. Uh, we're going to inspect it and make it into an Ask Review Controller. We've got to remember that Ask Review Controller needs uh, a label for the question. All right, let's see, question. Drag that out a little bit. And it also needs a text field for the answer. So put that in here. Oops, there we go. Um, maybe we'll make this stuff a little bigger font like that. There we go. Um, and then we'll just wire up these outlets. This is the question label. This is the answer text field. And then we're just going to segue from the add button to this. And this we're not going to push this one. We're going to do it modally in the same way uh, that we did before. And that makes sense here because uh, we're doing a plus to add a new document. We can't have a document without a name, so it really does need to be modal. It needs to block the app until uh, the answer. So we'll do modal here. And uh, the normal modal styles are fine. And we'll call this segue add document. Okay, since that's what the segue does, it's segue to add a document. Okay, makes sense. So we need to do prepare for segue for this segue. Uh, we don't need the index path for this, right? Because we're segueing from a button um, at the top. We just need to say if the segues identifier is equal to add document this time. Okay, then we need to create. Then it's really kind of an else here of all the rest of this stuff. Uh, we'll tab that over. All right. So uh, if we want to add a document, all we need to do is 
get our asker view controller. So let's import asker view controller. All right, where's our segue here? Right down here. That out of the way. So I'm just going to do asker view controller asker equals asker view controller cast of the segues destination view controller. Now I'm going to start sending messages to this asker view controller, and if it's not, it's going to crash, right? If this segue, if we somehow did a add document segue to something other than an asker view controller, that would crash. Is that bad? Not necessarily. Might actually be good because clearly your intent of this code is to work with an Astro View controller. And you could do some introspection here to make sure it really is an Astro View controller. And if it's not, then you could, uh, I don't know, do nothing or just, I don't know, kind of weird for the end user if nothing happens if you had a bug here. So it's almost better to have it crash and then in your testing, you'll immediately find, oh, whoops, we have a segue in one of our storyboards that segues to something that's not an ask review controller and that's expected. So sometimes crashing is not bad. It's good for finding bugs in some, ca uh, some cases. So what do we need to set uh, in our asker? Let's set the question, which is, let's just say uh, new document name something like that. And then really important with the asker, we need to set the delegate to be ourself. So to do that, sorry, let's make this bigger here. You can scroll up. So to make that, so we have to make sure we implement the ask review controller delegate. We'll go back down here and actually do that. You'll remember that that looks like this. Ask review controller did ask question and got answer. I'll go ahead and Separate that out so you can see that a little better. All right, so we hit plus, brought up the ask review controller, asked the, it asked the user for the new document name, they type it in and hit return. This gets sent to us. How, how are we going to respond to that? Um, all we need to do is create a URL for this new document that we just are going to create. And I'm going to do that by saying get our iCloud documents URL, because we're going to put this URL in the documents uh, directory. And I'm just going to append path, the answer. Now, one thing that's a little uh, interesting here is um, what if the user specifies the name of a document that already exists, right? And uh, in our case, it uh, might work. It might open up that existing document. But really, you would probably want to check that. You'd probably want to, if they tried to do a document that already exists, either whatever the name of the document, two on the end, or three, or whatever. Or perhaps you could put an alert up that says that document already exists, um, something like that. But we're not going to handle that case here. And uh, so we need to add this to our model, Okay, this new thing that they just added. So I'm going to get a mutable copy uh, of our documents. Okay. Oops. Do not like that feature in Xcode. Uh, so let's get a mutable copy uh, of our documents. Then I'm just going to add this URL to that. Uh, then I'm going to set the model to be this new thing I just mutated. Um, now I need to figure out what row, where it added that thing. So uh, I'm going to actually just do uh, ask the model to give me the index of that object, okay, because when I inserted it, if you'll remember, uh, our documents model setter sorts it so that things would be sorted in the right place. So that's why I have to ask now, where, where is it? Uh, then I'm going to create an index path that points to that row by just doing ns index, index path, uh, index path for row, that row, section zero. We only have one section in our whole, whole uh, table. And then I'm just going to perform the segue, and remember, I made my uh, perform for segue have this ability to have the sender be an NS index path, so that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to perform the show document segue with this index path. So in other words, the user just added the document, got put into the list, uh, I found out which row it is, now I'm going to actually segue and show them the document, which is going to cause its contents to be created. Because the photographers, when you uh, bring the photographer up with an empty document, it goes and does a flicker fetch okay, automatically for us. Uh, that's nothing new, that, it, it did that before. Uh, and then, of course, this is modal, so let's make sure we dismiss 
uh, our modal uh, thing. So let's see if this works. All right, so now one thing that we're going to want to watch here is when we do add a document with this new uh, application we just built, uh, it should be adding it to the other one. So we have both iPads here. Hopefully uh, you can see both iPads. And uh, I'm going to hit the plus button in our app right here. And you can see that the modal ask review controller has come up. So I'm going to call this uh, new one, uh, let's call it uh, lecture. Okay, we'll just call this lecture so we can see it. And so I'm just going to hit return here. And it's doing a flicker fetch to find it. Now, notice the other iPad has already found this, this document because we have that metadata query always running. Uh, it has found this other uh, document, the numbers document. And so here you can see this is the lecture document that we just created. Right? And uh, if we go back to our other iPad uh, and we look at its lecture document, it's going to be reading it, but not from Flickr. Okay? It's going out to the iCloud uh, to read it. And hopefully this will work. And there it is. So it's loaded it. So you can see that both of them have the same document. All right. So now, and if we go and create a document here on the other iPad, uh, so let's say plus, and we'll call this one uh, white iPad. That's what color this one is. So if I create one on the iPad, it's doing a flicker fetch. And over on the black one, you can see that it's added that as well. So creating these documents in the cloud, you know, they appear instantly as documents in the other uh, one. If you click on them and try and get the document, then you have to wait for the, it to download from the iCloud. And really, you have to wait for both to upload the change logs to the uh, cloud and then also uh, wait for it to come back down the other side. All right? So this is the white iPad here. And if we click it over here, we'll download there. Okay. So the next thing we want to do is talk about deleting... Uh, documents from the cloud. And deleting documents from the cloud is not as straightforward as just uh, getting the URL and deleting it. And the reason for that is if you delete a document uh, in the cloud, you want to make sure that all other devices that uh, uh, might be looking at that get a chance to participate uh, in that deletion. All right. And uh, so we're going to wait for that. Uh, and so I'm just going to make it here so that we can uh, delete by swiping and hitting delete, okay? And uh, the way we do that is has not been covered yet, and so this is a good opportunity to kind of show you how that works too. All right, so how do we do that? Uh, all right, so we do deletion in a table view using this method right here, which I didn't comment out the stub for, it's specifically uh, so you could see this. And uh, it's called commit editing style, table view commit editing style for row at index path. And uh, basically, if you do not implement this method, then you can't do the swipe for delete. Okay? Table views also have an editing mode. If you set them in, in their editing mode, then um, you can, then they'll have little uh, minus, red minus signs on the left. And if you click that, then it'll give you the delete button. So, but it's the button, but it's the same as the swiping. Okay? It just kind of puts the user in a mode so they can see more obviously, oh yeah, you can delete here. Uh, so we're going to uncomment this out. That's going to make it so we can swipe to delete. Okay. So now swiping to delete is going to work. Uh, there's also insertion. I'm not going to really talk about insertion today, but there is a way to basically say that a certain row uh, implements insertion, and therefore uh, it'll have a little green plus button when it's in editing mode. Okay. There's uh, you don't know, swipe in that case. It's a little uh, plus mode, but we're not going to do insertion. We're only going to do deleting. That's the only way we're going to allow editing. Um, uh, is by swiping to delete. So uh, what do we need to do to implement delete? It's actually pretty straightforward. Uh, as the comment says here, we need to delete the row from the data source and then delete the row from the actual table. Okay, so we need to do both of that. So let's go ahead and do the delete the row from the data source part. Uh, let's find the URL that we want to delete here. Um, and we're going to do that just by doing object at index, index path dot row. Okay, that's this row at index path that we were asked to commit the editing style for. 
And so now we have the one we want to delete, so I'm going to have to modify my model again. So I'm going to do the same thing I did before, which is to create a mutable copy. Mutable copy. And then I'm just going to, oops, sorry. Uh, documents remove object. Uh, that URL. Okay, so now we've removed it from this mutable copy. Now, I could say here self.documents equals documents like I did before, but I'm actually not going to say that. And the reason for that is uh, if I do that, then I wouldn't want to do this. Okay, this method right here deletes the row in question from the table, but it deletes it with a nice animation. And if I said self documents and documents, my table would update because it would reload, but it would not have a nice animation of that row kind of disappearing, right? It would redraw the whole table. And I want a nice animation here. So again, for expediency here, I'm going to do something probably you shouldn't really do, which is I'm going to set my instance variable directly because I do still need to update my model instance variable, but I'm not going to go through the setter. Uh, because I, I want to do this just to show you how this works. Uh, in your code, you might want to have a method like remove document or something like that that, uh, that modifies your instance variable in this way. Um, or you, and then it could do the delete itself. Uh, but here, just for expediency, I'm going to do that. And then the really important piece here is, of course, we need to remove this thing from the cloud. Okay. So here we've removed it from our model. Here we've removed it from the table. Here we're removing it from the cloud. Okay, so we need to implement this method, remove cloud URL. Okay, so the main thing of removing from something from the cloud is basically this method right here, exactly what you've seen before. File manager, default manager, Remove item at URL, URL, error, let's say remove error, MS error. Okay, so you would think this is all that's necessary, but it's not because of what I was saying before, where well, you need to coordinate with other devices that might be viewing this document um, at the same time. Okay, they need to understand that something is being uh, deleted here. Uh, so what we have to do is what's called file coordination. And not only that, I'm going to do this in another thread because this may not happen instantaneously. We're talking about going out to the cloud here, um, you know, network delays, whatever. It can take time. As we saw, it can take time for things to update from the cloud. It doesn't happen instantaneously. By definition, this is networking. So I'm going to do this in another thread. And I'm going to use uh, dispatch async here to do this. And I'm going to use this new method get global, global Q to do that. Dispatch Q priority default would be fine. And uh, so uh, as we talked about on the slide, dispatch get global Q just gets you a Q to use. It's a global Q that you can use. You don't have to create your own. Uh, serial queue and put things on it and then release it and all that. Uh, we didn't talk about this earlier because I wanted you to understand how queues that they are being created and that you're posting things on them and that there's different queues. But in reality, when we're just dispatching something that we just want to run in the background, we usually don't create a special queue for it. Uh, we'll just use a global queue like we're doing here. And so this is the block that we're going to have run on that queue. So again, I put this in here. It's still not enough to do that, okay? Um, the other thing is here, I'm gonna have this file manager be in another queue, so I'm not gonna use the default manager, I'm actually gonna alloc init one, okay? That's for uh, thread safety of NS file manager. You really shouldn't use the default manager outside of the main queue. Uh, okay, we're still not quite done there because we need to coordinate, and we do that coordination with an NS file coordinator, so I'll call this Coordinator, and we just say in this file coordinator, oops, coordinator alloc, uh, it, oops, init, init with file presenter. Now, the reason it, it's init has this file presenter is uh, if you are the file presenter that is doing this operation, uh, you do not be, need to be coordinated with. And so this is basically specifying which file presenter should not be involved in the coordination. Uh, here, 
we're not a file presenter. So all other file presenters need to be notified. So here we're just going to say nil. All right. So we're creating a coordinator that's going to do a coordinated action on this file, namely delete it. Um, but all other file presenters are going to be involved in doing the coordination for this. And uh, so then all we need to do here is possible errors here. So we'll do coordination error. Coordination error. Uh, we just say coordinator, coordinate writing for this URL. And the option here, you can look at these in the documentation, but uh, the one we want here is writing for deleting, because we're going to be deleting this file. And then here's the coordination error. Uh, and then this is very important here, this by accessor. And you can see that it has this argument, you are, it takes a URL as an argument. So I'm going to put that here, nsurl new URL. Uh, and then there's this block. So what is this block about? Okay, this block is where you do the coordinated activity. So in this case, this is where we're going to do this delete. But there's something very important to understand here is that the URL you're going to operate when you're coordinated is this URL. So this new URL is a URL that represents the same file or the same document that uh, this URL does, but it's a, a coordinated activity is enabled on it. So here I'm going to say new URL instead of URL. Okay, so I'm going to actually put in logging the errors here. So I have this nice thing, log error, which is kind of a nice little method. And uh, you could just call self log error. You give it the error. So here's, for example, the remove error. And it, you all can also specify the selector of the method that the error happened in. And there's a nice uh, kind of built-in variable, if you want to think of it, in all methods called underbar CMD, which is the selector that means this method. All right. And similar here, I'm going to also log error, the coordination error, if one happened. And the log error does nothing if this came back nil. Okay. So, um, so that's how we coordinate um, the removal here. And you could do other things here. And in fact, probably inside here, we would also want to remove the core data log files associated with this document as well. Okay, because you remember that core data files are stored kind of at the basic information, that document metadata.p list, but then there's also all those log files, so you probably want to delete those there. We're not going to put that code in here, but uh, you probably want to do that as well. Um, so I believe that that is all we need to do here, so let's go ahead and run this again. Let's see if our swiping is working. So again, we're going to have both. Uh, iPads up here, you can see them both at the same time. And uh, let's go, for example, and just delete this lecture thing we just created. So I just swiped, and when you swipe, it creates this little delete button. If you don't want to delete, you click on something else and it goes away, but you swipe and it comes back. And so now if I hit delete here, it deletes it from uh, the table, it deletes it from my model, and you can see it also deleted it from the cloud because the other uh, iPad showed it being deleted as well. All right? That makes sense to everybody? Okay, so now we have, uh, we can show what documents in the cloud, we can add documents in the cloud, we can look at documents in the cloud. What about if we want to edit the contents of documents in the cloud and want those content edits to appear on the other uh, devices? Okay, so, so far we've only actually edited the existence of the documents. We haven't gone, for example, in here and been able to delete one of these uh, lines in here. It would be nice if we deleted one of these lines in here, and then we went over to, our, uh, to the same document on the other one, we'd want that to update, and we'd want it to update automatically and in real time. Okay, so that's our next step. How are we going to do that? Okay, so um, first of all, let's go and make it so that our photographer table view, so that it's editable. Right? We made our document view controller table editable by implementing commit editing style. All right, Let's do the same thing over in our photographer's table view. So we can delete uh, things out of the table. And that'll be 
our editing is deleting out of the table. You know, another document will have more complicated editing maybe than just deleting things out of it, but um, that's what we're going to have for ours. So I'm just going to go in here and we're going to implement commit editing style here in photographer's table view. Just implementing this method, just by implementing it, we're going to have the swipe to delete. Okay, it's going to automatically make this like swipe to delete. And what I'm going to say here is if the editing style that we're trying to uh, commit here is UI table view uh, cell editing style delete. Okay, so if we're deleting, then I'm just going to get the photographer that was chosen to delete, which is uh, our fetch results controller. Uh, object at index path, index path. You'll remember that that's how you get uh, an object that was control that is was chosen in a fetch results controller driven table. You just ask the fetch results controller for that object to that index path. Um, then I'm just going to get the managed object context for the fetch controller and delete that object. Oops, delete the photographer. Um, and then I'm going to also save my photo database here. Now, this is not, strictly speaking, uh, necessary because you get autosave and this will automatically happen. Uh, notice that I'm not updating my table here. Okay, I'm not uh, going in and doing that uh, table view, delete rows, uh, uh, table like we did over here in the document. Right, we did this thing here, delete rows in index path. I'm not doing that. And why am I not doing that here in uh, the photographer one? That's because the fetch results controller is watching the context. And when we do this delete object in that context, it's automatically going to notice and update the table. So there's no reason for us to update it here. Um, in other words, modifying our model in a fetch results controller driven um, application automatically is going to uh, update your table because that's what fetch results controller does. It keeps the table in sync with the model. <clears throat> and the save to URL, again, I'm just doing that to try and hurry the process along because we got a demo. I don't want to wait, you know, 15 or 20 seconds, whatever it takes for the auto save happen, and then also have to wait for it to get up to the iCloud and then wait for it to come down. We're already going to have to wait uh, for things to update, so I'm just trying to uh, move that along. Uh, <clears throat> so... This would normally be enough, but actually there's one other thing you want to consider is that you don't want to allow deletion when your document is in a state where editing is disabled. So I'm going to put another if in here. I'm going to say if my photo database uh, document state um, is document state editing disabled, okay, if that... I want these there. Okay. If document state is not disabled, then we can do this. Okay. Now you might say, else what? Okay. What am I going to do here? Uh, maybe notify the user or perhaps um, not allow us to get here. Uh, and we could do that because there's another table view method called can edit row at index path. And uh, if document uh, if the document state was not editable, you could return no from that. Although you could have timing conditions there where the thing became editable later. So um, you could also just do nothing here. So the user swipes, hits delete. Oh, it doesn't delete. You know that. They'd probably try and delete it again if that's really what they wanted. So you can decide what you want to do in the case where um, the uh, document uh, state is not currently edit editable. And why would this disabled state happen? Uh, it can happen for a lot of reasons. Uh, other uh, presenters are saving the document or doing other things, um, but it kind of doesn't matter what the reason is. You shouldn't allow your document to be edited uh, if it, this editing state is disabled. Um, all right, so that's good, so we can delete, but that's not quite enough, okay? There's a little bit more we need to do here. One thing is, if a, the document gets edited by someone else, we need to be notified, okay? It's similar to what we talked about with the managed object context, where a context gets changed, somebody changes an object, and we're using a different context. We need to watch it and, and find out. Same thing the way NS Fetch Results Controller works. Okay? It watches the context to see when things change, and then 
um, it, uh, it updates. So we need to do the same thing here. But here what we're watching for is changes in the persistent store on the cloud. Okay? We're not we're looking just for changes in the context, uh, some local context. We want persistent changes. So uh, we have to register for a little different notification than we do uh, with the Anis Managed Object. So you know, a good place maybe to do that would be here when we're setting our, our database um, to register there. So let's go ahead and uh, add ourselves an observer here. So that's just NS Notification Center. Hopefully you're somewhat familiar now with Notification Center. Uh, and I'm going to add an observer. Make sure we get the right one here. Yes, that's the one. Uh, itself is going to be the observer. Um, the selector, I'm going to have it be, let's call it uh, document changed. Okay, because that's what's going on here. Uh, the all important name of the notification that we're going to watch is NS persistent store did import ubiquitous content changes notification. Okay, these are famous for being the longest names uh, in all of iOS here. Uh, and the object that we're watching to change in this case is uh, the photo database. Uh, the photo database is managed object context persistent store. Uh, context persistent store coordinator. Okay, so we're watching the persistent store coordinator when it imports ubiquitous changes. Remember, ubiquitous means from the cloud. Uh, when it uh, imports those, then we want to get this method document change called. Okay, so now how do we implement document changed? It's a notification. All NF notification methods take the same argument, which is a NF. Notif notification. Um, and uh, what do we want to do? It's actually a really easy way if you have core data and you get a content change to merge the changes in, uh, which is to use this method here called, okay, so we have our managed object context. We just got some changes from our ubiquitous store. We're going to use this method merge changes from context did save notification. Uh, notification. Now, this is normally merging changes from a context did save notification, which is some other context inside your app saved, and there were some changes in there, and you want to merge those changes into your contexts. Okay, but here, uh, this is uh, obviously coming from this ubiquitous content changes notification, but that notification delivers its user info in the same way, the same format as the context did save notification, so we can use this same method uh, to merge the changes. Now, what's really nice about merging these changes, too, is you'll get animation in your table because the changes will be made in your context and the fetch results controller will watch them being made and update your tab table in the animated way that it always does. Now, there's only one other thing I want to do, about, do here with observers, uh, which is that I want to make sure I remove myself as an observer at the right time. Okay, and there's two cases when I want to do that. One is uh, I think I want to remove myself as an observer uh, when a new database is set. I want to remove the old one. So I'm going to remove observer self um, for this uh, NS persistent store did import. Yeah, that whole thing uh, for the object, the old photo databases managed object context dot persistent score coordinator, and the other place that I want to do this uh, is uh, in Dialic, right? In Dialic, if you remember, we always really want to go to the notification center and remove ourselves as an observer. I like to put this at the very bottom of the file, though. So let's do that. Okay, so let's just make sure that we uh, uh, have uh, so that we're removing ourselves from the server. We're not observing for changes uh, that we no longer are interested in. Uh, okay, so hopefully, again, if I missed something there, let's go ahead and see if this works. So in this case, it's a little different. Now I'm going to open up both documents. Okay, So over here uh, on my white iPad, I have capitalized open. And now I'm going to open up capitalized, just le reading it from the cloud. Now it's got it open. And so now if I delete something here, let's say, B -A -A, let's just delete one that's very noticeable under bar here. So if I delete that one, 
then it's going updating to the cloud, etc. Um, it's got to update the other side, and you can see that it updates here on this side too, and the opposite as well. So let's up, delete this first one on uh, our white iPad, and then over on here, hopefully we'll see this same line delete on ours if we implemented our thing properly. It can take a little while because uh, you both have to have the uh, thing update, go up to the cloud, the changes, the change logs, and they also have to come back down. And then they have to be noticed here by this uh, notification. Uh, and then it has to update it. There we go. So it's finally uh, updated it there. It took a little while. Um, and you can do this uh, on both sides at the same time since the changes are going to be merged. So let's, you know, delete a whole bunch over here. Oops. And then same thing over here. Let's delete some C's. So you can see even as I'm deleting it, it's updating on both sides. Okay. And um, so, uh, so you kind of, you can get things overlapping. One thing, obviously, if you, what happens though if you make changes on one side that are kind of inconsistent with the other side? Okay, now with deleting, it's not as likely that's going to happen because uh, you, you know, you're deleting the object, it's gone. If both sides deleted it, then it'd be gone on both sides. But, uh, and you can see it's there, it's doing some updating right there. Um, but if you were perhaps changing the same attribute in both objects, then merging might be more difficult. And it is possible, uh, if you look in the documentation for NS Manage Object Context, you can specify how to deal with merges, like take the latest version, raise an error, and then you have to handle it yourself, etc. cetera. Um, so <clears throat> I'll leave that kind of an exercise to the, to the user, for what kind of conflict resolution you want. Uh, but it is possible uh, to, uh, to specify that. Um, one other thing here I'm going to show really quickly is how to monitor document state changes because in the cloud it's slightly more likely that your document state will change as you're running. Uh, for example, you might be saving and you could get a saving error. Okay, and you might want to get notified, oh, I have a saving error, and maybe try again. So how do you do that? And you do that with the observing as well. All right. <clears throat> so here I'm just going to observe but I'm going to observe a little different thing here. I'm going to call this document state changed. And this is called UI manage, oh, what's it called? Uh, sorry, let me make sure I get it right here. It's called, yes, UI document state change notification. So this is the document state. And here we're observing the document itself, right? And we probably want to do the same thing up here, which is, we'll copy and paste it up here that oops and we don't want that okay so we're moving ourselves as an observer and adding ourselves as an observer and the document state changed oops Um, so you can handle interesting cases. There are lots of different interesting cases you can handle here. Uh, one is um, the document state, UI document state in conflict. Now, I'm not going to talk about that one uh, for time reasons here. Uh, the main thing to think about here is uh, using the NS file version uh, class. Uh, it's what lets you iterate through all the uh, com conflicting versions of this file and decide which one you're going to use. Now, again, using core data, your merging changes uh, is not as big an issue there, but I'll, I'll post kind of a typical what this might look like uh, online for if you want to uh, resolve conflict between documents uh, by, like, let's say, taking the most recent one, which is probably the simplest uh, resolution. So uh, we'll leave that to, on, uh, to post it online. Um, another one here is uh, document state uh, saving error. So that's UI document state uh, saving error. And if you get a UI document state saving error here, you might want to, you know, try again and maybe uh, notify user if you tried a whole bunch of times and you couldn't do it or something like that. That's really up 
to you to decide what you want to do when you have a saving error. But this is how you monitor it, okay, by adding yourself uh, as an observer. The last thing I want to do is the key value store, the NS user defaults, the iCloud NS user defaults. And to do that, what I'm going to do is, uh, if you go back to our app here, you see at the top level, we have uh, the names of the documents. I'm going to have a subtitle on each one, which is how many photographers are in that document. Okay? So it's just going to kind of give you a clue. Is this a big document with a lot of photographers or a small document with a few? Um, and we're going to store that information, that little subtitle. We're going to store it uh, in this ubiquitous uh, key value store, which is the NS user defaults in the cloud. And then hopefully we'll see uh, it update uh, on the other one when we change it. So how do we do that? A uh, couple of things here. Uh, I'm going to modify uh, my photographer's table view controller right here so that every time I save, I update that little string. Okay, so I'm going to add a new method here called save. And I'm going to put all my uh, saving stuff in there. So let's go find where I save. So here's a place that I save. So self-save. Where else do I save? Um, here's another place. No, and that's creating. Uh, here's another save right here. This is when we're editing, of course. All right. All right, so those are the only two places. So I'm going to put the save in here instead. And when I do that save, uh, I'm going to update uh, with the number of uh, things. So what we're going to do is I'm going to put this in the completion handler here. Cool. Success. So again, hopefully you're all familiar with saving to URL and having completion handler. So how am I going to find out what it is? That's easy. Uh, I'm going to use a new method here that I haven't shown you before. Uh, I'm going to create a fetch request. That's fetch request into my photographer table. And uh, the photographer count can be obtained just by getting our context and calling this new method count for fetch request. So count for fetch request uh, takes a, re a fetch request and it returns you the number of entities that would be returned if that fetch was made, but it doesn't actually make the fetch. Okay, it uses a SQL. Those of you who know SQL, there's a mechanism in SQL to count the number of items in a table that match a certain query, and so that's what it does. And I don't really care if there's an error here. Photographer count would return zero. It's okay, it's zero. And you might want to be more uh, tolerance of errors than that. Um, and so then I'm just going to make the little document note, the little thing that I want in my subtitle by saying uh, ns string, oops, string, string with format, we'll say percent %d photographers, photographers, photographer count. Okay, so that's going to be the little string that I want to appear as my subtitle uh, in my uh, list of documents. And then I need a key for my NS user defaults on the cloud, my NS ubiquitous key value store. So I'm going to call that document note key, and we'll have that be the name of the document. Let's say, again, you yeah, probably want a little better uh, something than that, but in a demo, you have to cut some corners here. Uh, so this is the file URL, URL's last path component. Okay, so that's the key. And then we're just going to use the ubiquitous key value store, default store, set object, the note for the key. And really uh, important, uh, if you want things to update quickly, uh, is to do synchronize. But uh, one thing to understand about synchronize with the ubiquitous key value store is it's not going to immediately write to the cloud right there. Okay, You obviously want that happening in another thread. You don't want that happening blocking your main thread or anything like that. All synchronize really does is indicate, okay, I'm finished with a batch of changes. You probably want to go update this sometime. But if you call synchronize over and over and over, it's not going to constantly be updating, all right? Really, NS user, you have to remember that uh, this is all happening over the network. And so these changes you make, they have to propagate to other devices. And so none of this stuff is instant. Um, but usually, just like with NS user default, when you've made a bunch of changes, kind of in a little batch, 
you want to say synchronize, it kind of tells um, the, the system, uh, iOS, that, uh, yeah, you might want to do an update right now. But even if you don't do an update, it's going to synchronize it eventually um, at a kind of an appropriate time. You can think of it somewhat as autosave. Uh, but uh, you probably want to do the synchronize here. Um, so that's updating our little uh, document note. Uh, what about receiving changes? What happens when someone else uh, makes uh, some change to that document note, and we want to make sure we see it. Well, we see the list of documents not here in Photographer's Table View. We see it in the Document View Controller. So I'm going to go back to Document View Controller here, and again, I have to make an observer here to observe changes to the key value store. Okay, So I'm going to add another observer. A good place to do it here is when I create this iCloud query, because once I've created the query to start getting stuff, then I might as well start seeing changes to the ubiquitous store at that point too. So again, another notification, add observer self, and uh, we'll call this one, uh, I think I call this uh, ubiquitous uh, key value store updated, I call it. And the name of this notification is NS Ubiquitous Key Value Store Changed ex Store uh, Did Change Externally Notification. Um, and then the object is the store, and this is very important not to put nil here. Okay, you need to put this, the actual store, which is NS Ubiquitous Key Value Store Default Store. Okay. If you don't put this here, if you never ask for this default store, then the mechanism inside iOS that kind of keeps track of it and all this stuff never actually gets hooked up. Okay. So just because you register this uh, observing, uh, it's not going to actually start doing anything, watching anything, until you ask for the default store. So it's really important there not to put nil and to put the store. That's what you want to observe anyway, so that's the right thing. Now, we have this method here, ubiquitous key value store update that we have to implement. Notification. And yeah, you can do a lot of things here. This notification has a user info object and you can look inside of it and see what keys have changed and things like that. Um, I'm going to, again for expediency, just reload my table. Okay. And, oops reload my table. And by reloading my table, then it's going to call self or row and index path for everything. And I'm going to modify self or row and index path um, to use this new uh, key. So let's do that. Down here in, oops, where's self or row and index path? It's right here. Okay, so here's self or row and index path. Right now, I have this detail text label set to nil. That's why it's coming up uh, as nil. Uh, but we need to change it to uh, look at the value of the thing. So I'm going to do that just by saying uh, NS ubiquitous key value store, default store, object for key. Uh, and we need the name of the document is the key, so URL last path component. Okay? So I'm just going to get that string uh, out of there uh, and look at it. Now, one thing that's really interesting to note here is that this notification that we signed up for up here, this ubiquitous key value store did change externally notification. Notice the word externally there. You only get this not notification if the key value store changed externally. If you change it, you don't get this notification. So you're going to have to either post your own notification internally to your app, or I'm going to cheat a little bit and uh, in view will appear, I'm just going to reload my table. <laughs> So, just so you can see this working. Okay, so I'm reloading my table. So, I, we look at a document, let's say we delete some photographers. When we come back, view will appear, it'll happen again. I'm going to reload my table to show you there. But you're going to see it updating uh, on the other guys, uh, the other iPad um, as well. So, let's take a look at that. Hopefully, I haven't forgotten anything here either. Now, this other, this white iPad, uh, I actually have its version of this. doesn't do the updating. That's because I didn't want you to be too confused about seeing that before we implemented it. Uh, but here, let's go ahead and uh, go into Capitalize. For example, let's delete something. 
like this. Uh, and when we come back, now you see it says 55 photographers. So that key value thing has been updated. And you can see now it also updates on the white one. Okay. And uh, similar here, if we go in here and make a change that causes that thing to be updated, see it update here, and we'll see it eventually update on the other one. Okay? Make sense? We change it again. Let's go from four down to three. Change three here. Again, we reloaded table here. That's why it changed here. But over here, it's going to get that notification. It changes to three there. Okay? All right, so that's all I have to show you today. Uh, I'm going to post all of this code with, similar to how I did with Photomania in the first place, which is to uh, you know, have kind of step-by-step -step numbered instructions to repeat what I did here. I will add a couple of extra things in there, like the file version stuff, uh, just so you can see what that generally looks like. It's pretty, I'm going to put a pretty generic implementation uh, in there. Uh, but otherwise, hopefully, this will give you a general idea how to do this iCloud stuff. Uh, you know, it is networking programming, and so anytime you're talking about networking programming, it requires a little more mind uh, power because you have to think about things that can happen not in real time. Things happening, it's kind of like multi-threaded, only a little worse because not only can things happen you know, at some unknown future time, but they can fail, <laughs> okay? You can fail to get some information. Something might, some network might be down or something like that. So you have to be pretty fault tolerant. And uh, in this demo, I haven't really put a lot of fault tolerance in. So I don't want you to get the idea, oh, just copy this code and boom, you're on your way. It'll all just work perfectly. Uh, you're going to have to think about if you really want to have documents on mul multiple devices. And the testing of it is really important as well. Uh, to make sure what happens if the network goes down, you know, in the middle of this update or something like that. Um, but the mechanism is pretty cool. The fundamental mechanism of having these queries, seeing what's changing over there, being able to change the documents, getting NS notifications when things change. Um, that's the main mechanism, and uh, it makes that part of it uh, pretty easy for you. Okay, so that's it. So again, I won't see you until the final exam period. Um, but there is a guest lecture next Tuesday, unit testing. So I uh, hope you enjoyed that. And um, we'll see you later. Thanks. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.